All right. So, who read what last week of the scriptures? I read Kings chapter 20, verse 5. Kings chapter 20, verse 5. All right. Second Kings, actually. Second Kings chapter 20, <laughs> verse 5. You read one verse. What does the verse say? Um, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears, and I will heal you. Who is the prayer for? I have no idea. Did you read any of the context? Nope. How did you just, did you just like pick, flop open the Bible and just pick a verse? Yep. Do you read in con, do you read anything in context? Like, are you pulling my leg? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So next time, try to read the paragraph. Okay. <clears throat> Zion, did you read anything? Yeah, I read all of First Peter and First Peter. Uh, started Second Peter. Second Peter. Wow. What'd you get out of it? Uh, can I check my phone real quick? Yeah. Uh, did you Did you take notes? Did you mark notes down? Yeah, kinda. This was funny. Uh, I, I like randomly opened the Bible to the verse to the chapter and this was the it was behold I am in laying in Zion a stone a cornerstone chosen and precious good it's a good verse all right I have been reading out of Matthew Matthew chapter 12. I've been reading there for a few weeks now. Just the whole, well, actually, the whole chapter and then the first portion of the chapter, which we will go over because I've got a little uh, <clears throat> a practice exercise for us, which I'll probably show the diagrams online if we get to the diagrams. All right. So, oh, I thought you were. We are continuing with uh, the heart. Last lesson, we talked about uh, the prayer and heart condition. We looked specifically, we looked at Jeremiah and the context and how the heart is everything. Well, I can't say the heart is everything, but it's quite important. All right. Question. Can you turn your heart to the Lord? No. Mm. No hands raised. Any, Zion? No. No. Correct. Question. Can you do anything concerning God or that which pertains to God? Naomi? No. Correct. Man has absolute zero ability whatsoever concerning the living God or that which pertains to the living God. Now concerning, <clears throat> concerning the idols, our concepts of God, well, we can do this, we can do that. But concerning the living God himself, Man has absolute zero ability. We just don't think that. We think we can do something. We think we do know something. And therefore, we, we rely upon our own strength and not upon the ability and power of another. And so I like where um, Jeremiah was, where the Lord had Jeremiah speaking to them, to the children of Israel. And the thing is, is that when by the Spirit of God we come to realize this, I mean, that we really truly come to realize this, like when you open your Bible and you know that unless the Lord by His Spirit perform a miracle, then you're just reading words on a page and it'll go in one ear and out the other. And so when we realize that and it's like, oh, do I just really want to do that? Or do I actually want, do I want my heart to come to the intended end for which God gave the scriptures? And there's a reason. 
God didn't just provide us with the scriptures just so we could have another quote-unquote book to put on the shelf or another quote-unquote book to read. No, he gave the scriptures with an intended end and an intended goal. And so we can approach the scriptures in either one of two ways. With just reading them just to read them, which regardless, if you're reading the scriptures, that is good. Regardless of where your heart is. Reading the scriptures, it is good. And I'll tell you this even right now. Your heart concerning the scriptures, we never go to the scriptures with the correct motive. Period. Except God do something in our heart, we read the scriptures for something other than his intended end. And it's always like that. That's why that's why I just love uh, Jeremiah here where the Lord uh, was speaking through Jeremiah to his people, it's like, and it's like man, the heart of man is deceitfully wicked, deceitfully, uh, extremely sick. It it does not choose God. It does not want God. It does not, uh, quote unquote, follow the Lord. And the sooner, the sooner the Spirit of God convinces us of what is true, then we can agree with Him and ask Him to do what we cannot do. And see, even even if we're praying that prayer, a prayer similar to the following, Lord, do in my heart what I cannot do. When I read the scriptures, bring me to in my heart to your intended end, to your intended purpose. If we're actually reading that and 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 praying that prayer when reading the scriptures, then the Spirit of God has actually been doing something in our heart. If we are praying along these lines, Lord, what is it really all about? As I read as I read your scriptures, as I read your written word, show me what it's really all about. If we're praying any prayer similar to that, that is because the Spirit of God has been doing something upon the ground of the heart because no man can come to Christ except the Father draw him. Period. That's just a fact. All right, so this is uh, continuing on concerning the heart. The posture of our heart is incorrect when we go to the Scriptures, when we go to the Bible, uh, and I'll just give a couple examples, and I'll ask you guys uh, for some more examples, uh, to be more like Jesus. Does anybody, does anybody have a thought concerning that as a why I say that? Anything? Repeat the question. Okay. The posture of our heart is incorrect when we go to the Scriptures, when we go to the Bible, and here are the examples, to be more like Jesus. When we go to the Bible, when we go to the Scriptures to be more like Jesus, then the posture of our heart is incorrect. Does anybody know why? Naomi. Because we're looking to improve ourselves and not turn to God. Okay, I like that. Sign? Because you can't be like Jesus. Yes, perfect. I love that. Awesome responses. Okay, with Naomi's, we're self-centered and self-absorbed. We're not even considering Him. We're considering ourselves as the end product, like me more like, or me this or that. So we're actually going to the scriptures for me. Does that make sense? All right. With Zion, with what Zion just shared, it is completely impossible to be another person. You cannot, we cannot be Christ. Though we may deceive ourselves and trick ourselves and trick others, and where they're like, oh, wow, well, you're like Jesus. You're a whole lot like Jesus. We don't trick God the Father. God the Father, the living God, accepts no imposters. He didn't give us the scriptures so we can try to be someone whom we are not. He gave us the scriptures so we can come to this person whom we are not 
come to his son. That's why he gave the scriptures. That is the supreme end goal of the scriptures, to come to the son of the living God. And that is done by the work of the Holy Spirit when our heart is beholding the testimony in the scriptures, in the scriptures, which are a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, or that is done by the Spirit of God if we are only seeing the scriptures as the law and we're trying to be someone whom we are not. Remember, um, we covered this a few months back, possibly, where Paul said the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Do you guys remember the verse? Yeah, Naomi might not. You should remember it, Zion. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Okay. The word schoolmaster, well, let's ask Naomi since she wasn't in the lesson. What, do you, what, what does the word schoolmaster mean? Or what do you think it means? I don't know. Okay, what does it sound like it means? Smart person. Don't be smart with me, kiddo. <laughs> think about it. Schoolmaster. Okay. Mastered school. Okay. Uh, have you ever heard of this word, pedagogy? Only you would think of that. It's have, supposed to mean like. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't give it away yet. Have you ever have you heard the word pedagogy? No. Okay. In today's modern use, it actually comes from a Greek word pedagogas, but in today's modern use, the word pedagogy applies to like a teacher, a tutor, but. When Paul wrote it, that's not what it meant. That's not what, that's not what the word meant at the time. The word, the law was our schoolmaster. The word schoolmaster is by the logos. And all that is, I love the way, the way Noah said it. When, when I asked him, he said, oh, it's the school bus. That's a pretty rough definition, but pretty much, yeah, that's what it is. The law was the vehicle that brought and brings us to Christ. That's what the law serves. I used to say this uh, when I was first born again, and I really didn't fully understand it like I do now, but it's actually true. It's like <clears throat> when you are born again, your heart, well, even before you're born again, and when you're born again, your heart will either come to Jesus peacefully that is when the testimony is being presented in the scriptures and we receive him as a substance of the testimony or kicking and screaming the law. And so either way, the scriptures have the intended end, regardless of what our heart, of where our heart is. All right. So I wrote this, I wrote this, I gave this example, and I'll read, I'll read the statement again. The posture of the heart is incorrect. The posture of the heart is incorrect when we go to the scriptures, the Bible, and here was one of the examples to be more like Jesus. What I wrote here, it is basically this. This is the great deception in the garden. And we don't realize that. This is Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. Zion, do you want to pull it up real quick? Genesis 3, 1 through 5. I guess I forgot to put the Bible app on this. Hold on, hold on. Just follow along. Genesis 1. Uh, 3, 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more subtle than any wild creature that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Then keep on reading uh, through five. 
What do you mean through five? Um, through verse five. Okay. For God knows what. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman that's, that's good. You didn't read verse 4. Okay, read verse 4 and verse 5 again. But the servant said to the woman, You shall not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. There you go. So God says one thing, the serpent says another thing, and then the serpent continues with his lie. And there it is. And you will be like God. Impossible. Impossible. That is, here we go. <clears throat> I'll see if I remember to put this diagram up there for everybody online. Y'all see this? Yes. That is this, this object. This is us, us who are born again. This is our concept of us. Do you guys know what that symbol means? No. Does not equal. Correct. Does not equal. See, because it's equals, not. Does not equal. Red button. Okay. It's supposed to be Jesus. It's a picture, a picture of the eternal. God. The living God. God Christ his son. Uh, life. The life is in the blood. Okay, so it's just a diagram. So, once again... Man is a blockhead. Man does not equal God in any shape, fashion, form, respect, or thought at all, period. That's the great deception. The square does not equal the circle. That is right. The square does not equal the circle. Blockhead right. cannot be eternal. That's right. And then for the person who is born again, our natural mind does not attain unto the mind of Christ. Our heart is either submitted to our natural mind or our heart is either submitted to the mind of Christ. All right, let's see what I have right here. Okay. Uh, going on with, with our examples, the posture of our heart is incorrect when we go to the scriptures, when we go to the Bible, to learn to be more loving, more kind, more generous, more righteous. Now, why is that incorrect with those terms? Anybody? All right. Uh, the posture of our heart is incorrect when we go to the scriptures, when we go to the Bible, to learn to be more loving, more kind, more generous, more righteous. And these are just examples. Any thoughts? All right, how about the first one? Is it a question? Yeah. The first one, loving. Here's the verse, God is love. So it all falls back to the, first, the very first statement. When we go to the scriptures trying to be more loving, we're actually trying to be more like God, who is love. You can't be Jesus. Exactly, you cannot be Jesus. No matter how much you think you can, man has zero, zero ability whatsoever concerning the living God and that which pertains to the living God. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Here is one that I don't know if you guys ever have, have, have ever... Um, Okay, I got this little comment here. It says, ask the students. <laughs> All right, so here's my question for you guys. Or actually, here's my statement for you guys. Uh, you guys, listen up here. I want you to grow two inches. Shall I set a timer? I want you to grow two inches. You ready? 
Go for it. I can't grow two inches. Why not? Oh, good response. Sign, you have a thought? I can't grow two inches. Why not? I don't know. Because it takes too long. It takes longer than... Than a moment. Than a minute. If... <clears throat> If Naomi, look up the word, do a search, and it's uh, you'll find it on the with a little magnifying glass. I already got there. What do you want me to search? Least. And I want you to go to the New Testament and see where Jesus says. Least. Okay. And he says something like, I think the word is least. He says something like, if you if you cannot do the least, why do you think you can do anything else? Yeah, I already found it. Boom. All right, everybody. Naomi, Luke chapter 12, verse 25. Crazy word. Yeah. Luke 12, starting with 25 and then verse 26. Luke 25. 12, 25. And which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Now 26. Is he? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Boom. The context of this passage is not worrying how, and it's like uh, how God provides what is needed. And like the verse in uh, just preceding it, consider the ravens for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And then he goes, so that's the context. But what he says here, and which of you by worrying can add one cubit to a stature? Do you guys know what a cubit is? Yes, Naomi? What was it's that? from your elbow to your fingertip too. Okay. The standard cubit was a measurement of antiquity from the elbow to the tip of your fingers. I only noticed that dad said they could have a hunks of wood in the side of it, less, more than a cubit. There you go. Good response. But he says this, And which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Verse 26, and here's the key point of the whole thing. If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? So Jesus says that if we can't grow one cubit tall, Add one cubit to his stature, his his height, his his. If we can't even do that, Jesus says that's easy. Then why do we worry about the rest? Okay. So with that, that is man's ability. Zero. We cannot do the least concerning ourselves much less and an a great total impossibility we can do anything concerning the living God and that which pertains to the living God. All right? Uh, the posture of the heart is incorrect. Here's another example. The posture of our, our heart is incorrect when we go to the Scriptures, when we go to the Bible, for anything less than the person of Jesus Christ Himself. Now, listen to my question, guys. Based on that, <clears throat> based on that true statement, 
The posture of our heart is incorrect when we go to the Scriptures, when we go to the Bible, for anything less than the person of Jesus Christ Himself. Here's my question. Can God use our incorrectness? Yes or no? Yes. Good. Correct. Yes. Question. Why? Simon? Because it still got us in the Scriptures. Because what? It still got us in the Scriptures. Okay. Tell me. Because He can show us how much He's changed us. Okay. Okay. I'll take us. Good, good responses. Got a better response. We're blockheads. This is our concept of what we think our life is when our heart is submitted to the natural mind. Man, up here, eyes up here, uh, Naomi, is never correct. Right? Man, either non-born again man or the one who is born again, never has the correct motive, period. It is all a miracle of God. Man can take, can take no credit whatsoever for anything if our heart is directed unto Christ by any means. Or, get this, or if we are reading the Bible, the Scriptures, man can take no credit for that. Cool. All right, let's see. Here we go. The supreme, all-governing, all-encompassing theme of the Scriptures. Did you guys get that? Yes. That's pretty all-inclusive. The supreme... All governing, all encompassing theme of the scriptures. This is uh, Webster's 1828 dictionary definition for the word theme. A subject or topic on which a person writes or speaks. Like, there's a purpose for our Bible. There's a purpose for our scriptures. It's not our purpose, it's God's purpose. He has a theme. He has a, an intended end for which he gave them to man. All right, now, uh, aha, question. All right, once again, the theme, a subject or topic on which a person writes or speaks. So, here's my question. What is the theme of the scriptures? Naomi. Jesus. Jesus. What's the reason for your response? Because when you don't know the answer, you say Jesus. Because what? She said when you don't know the answer, you say Jesus. When you don't know the answer, you say Jesus. Because Jesus is the answer. He is the answer. All right. Is there... or? Is there a verse that declares this very thing? Um, there is some verse in the Bible, I think, that says Jesus is the answer, but I don't know which one. No, that, that declares that Jesus is the theme of the scriptures. Yeah, there is, because uh, you search the scriptures, and then you think you will have eternal life, but there, which is that testify of me. Perfect. What verse is that? John 5.39. I ended up memorizing that verse after the Spirit of God ingrained it in my heart, like the address. <clears throat> the theme of the Scriptures is Christ Jesus Himself. He, he is the supreme, all-governing, all-encompassing theme of the Scriptures. All right. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a little grammar here. Concerning the 
parts of a sentence, what is the subject in a sentence? The noun. Okay. Person, place, or thing. Okay, anything more? Or idea. Okay, is that it? All right, this is the Pasco Hernando State College website where I got this. I just searched it online real quick. Uh, concerning parts of, a, parts of a sentence, the subject is the subject of a sentence identifies who or what the sentence is about. So what is the subject of the Bible? Jesus. Correct. Give me one verse why you say that. He gave that same verse words. Perfect, yes. Which verse was it? John 5.39. Thank you, John 5.39. That's one verse out of a myriad of verses that declare the same thing. How that Christ is the theme, the subject of the scriptures. Okay. Now, <clears throat> concerning the theme, concerning the subject of the scriptures... Uh, it is currently, it will always be Christ. All other characters or things are in relation to Christ himself. For example, like Paul. When he's talking about Paul, it's actually Paul in relation to Christ himself. Christ is always the theme and subject of the scriptures. Now I've got our practical exercise here. Matthew chapter 12, let's start with verse 1. Go ahead and look it up real quick. Matthew 12, verse 1. <clears throat> Matthew 12, verse 1? Yep. I'm there too. Okay. Verse 1. Chapter 12, verse 1. Yep. Okay. Uh, Zion, let's have you read verse 1 and verse 2. Okay. And read it, read it slow because I want to be stopping you all the way, all right? At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. Hold it right there. With that statement, who's the main character? Jesus. 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 Perfect. At that time, Jesus. What else do we know about the statement? He went through a corn field. Grain field, okay. And when? Here, here's a, I know you guys learned this at some point. Who, what, when, where? Why and how, right? Yeah. Who, what, when, where, why, and how, all right? Who, when, where, why, last and simple, though, because. www.asiancd. Since Friday. Since Friday? It's in writing. Okay, well, there you go. Well, I'm just going to stick with what I know. <laughs> so the who is Jesus. And the what, I guess he was walking through the grain field. And the where, yeah, and the when, on the Sabbath. perfect, on the Sabbath. That's the whole context. So it's all about Jesus. He's walking through the grain field, and it's the Sabbath. And it all revolves around Jesus. All right, keep on going, Zion. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck ears of grain and to eat. Okay, hold it right there. Now it brings up his disciples, but his disciples... Are what? Hungry. Yeah. But they're his. They're his disciples. The disciples are with him. Yeah, here we go. Here's the diagram. Whoops, sorry. Jesus, the center of it all. His disciples are with them. It's all about Jesus. And so his disciples aren't. I mean, it's just not any disciples. It's, as Zion said, his disciples. And on top of that, they are with him. They are those who are with Christ himself. That's the context. Those who are with Christ himself. All right, going on. Verse 2. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Okay. Not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Where do we, where do they get that? The law. It's against the law. 
the law. They got it from the law. They got it from the Torah, the law. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you weren't man on the Sabbath is not supposed to do any work whatsoever. He should be at rest, doing nothing. All right. So they're saying that the disciples are doing what is unlawful, but the disciples are actually with Jesus, whether Jesus is eating grains himself or not. The whole context is that Christ Jesus is the center of the whole passage of the whole picture here. All right. Uh, Naomi, read verses 3 through 4. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? Okay, hold on. Oh, yeah, keep on going. He and those were with him. All right, hold it right there. Now, Jesus is giving examples. Now, who are we talking about? David. Okay, perfect. David. Now, <clears throat> um... Who is David? My uncle. Biblically speaking, Simon. Uh, uh, someone that was a king. Correct. I mean, what do you want his whole story? Okay. I mean, no, no. A king of Israel uh, killed Goliath by the Spirit of God. All right. David the king. All right. God's first king. All right. But David, the historical David, is a person. But scripture-wise, David is also a testimony of Christ. Right? He is. David is like a picture of Jesus. That God was presenting a testimony time and time and time again throughout the Old Testament. All right? So now, what's the context? We've got David and what else? And those who are with him. And those who are with him. Perfect. So look at the, the diagram again. We've got David, who is a type of Christ, and those who are with him. All right, Naomi, keep on reading. Now he entered the house of God and ate the show, the show bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Alone. Correct. And so what... What Jesus is presenting is saying, hey, according to the quote-unquote law, David and his men were breaking the law. But remember the context. Jesus is in the field, and his disciples are with Jesus. The first example Jesus gives, David at the temple and his, dis and his disciples <laughs> and his, uh, <laughs> what are the, his companions were with him, okay? Uh, Zion, read verse 5 through 6. <clears throat> or have you not read in the law how the Sabbath, the priests in the temple, profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, some things are greater than the temple. Something greater than the temple is here. Okay, verse 5. And now Jesus gives another example. Have you not read in the law? Because that's their whole issue. They think that Jesus' disciples are breaking the law that they're doing what is not lawful. Here's another example that Jesus gives. Have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple, okay? So the setting is the Sabbath, the same setting that Jesus and his disciples are currently in, the time frame. The temple and the priests. Now you have the temple, singular, and you have the priests, plural. Just like you have Jesus, singular, and his disciples, plural. David, singular, and his companions, plural. You have the temple. Yeah. Now, what is the temple in the Old Testament? Or shall I say, what does the temple represent? Zion? Jesus. Perfect. <laughs> they testify of Christ. So here, Jesus gives two examples of the singular object, and then those who are gathered to that singular object. All right, and I'll read. I'll read the last because I think everyone let let out. Uh, this is verse seven through eight. But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned. 
the innocent. Remember the verse that I gave you guys uh, early on from Paul? He said that the law was our schoolmaster to what? Anybody remember? Sion? I think it was to bring us to Christ. Correct. Correct. If anything, the ones who were doing what was not lawful, the ones who were quote unquote breaking the law, breaking the Sabbath, were the Pharisees and everybody else because the law had worked to whatever degree in the disciples' hearts and they had come by the Spirit of God to Christ. So they are actually obedient to the law in its purest essence and sense. That was the whole point. That's the whole point why God gave the law to bring us unto Christ. Remember, we're either coming uh, peacefully or kicking and screaming, but it's to come unto Christ. Did you guys see that? I did. It blew me away. I totally rejoiced in the Lord when I saw it. But see, that's, that's the whole thing. That's why the law isn't this list of do's and don'ts. The law serves a purpose. It serves God's purpose, and that's to bring us to His Son. The disciples came to his son. And then everything from that moment onward is I don't even know how to describe it. It's not the list of do's and don'ts. It's relationship from that point onward. And then you quote unquote seemingly end up doing what seems unlawful. But it's not because it's based upon relationship. And that's why Jesus brought in David and his men and the temple and the priests because there was a relationship with the living God. So that was just an example how that the supreme, all-governing, all-encompassing theme of the scriptures of the Bible is Christ Jesus. All right, that's it for the list lesson. We'll see you guys next time. Lord bless.